Hello, I'm taping this from the backyard of my home right now. There are a few things that I'm learning to live with in the last few weeks. Not having live sports on TV, not being able to attend a restaurant and sit down and eat, not being able to preach to the Fellowship of North Shore Bible Church live. Hopefully, this will not last last much longer because there is one thing humans have a hard time living without and that is hope we all need hope hope is basic to human life you take away hope and you take away our desire for survival it's essential let me give you a few words on hope that people have spoken uh, there was a man who lived in the 1900s he was a cynical newspaper editor and author, his name was H.L. Mencken, and he said this, a hope is a pathological belief in the occurrence of the impossible. Other people have said, and we say it right now, I just said it, I hope this works out soon. I hope I get a new job. I hope you are well. All good things. But biblical hope is more than just the above. Biblical hope is a source of strength and encouragement from God that he gives us through his spirit and his word. Biblical hope, a definition I would say is this. It is the confident assurance of things not seen. It is a firm conviction that is directed toward the future. It is based on God's character and God's promises that are found in his word. Now, faith is trusting God right now in the presence. Faith and hope are very similar, but I think hope has more of a concern with a future faith. It's trusting God for whatever is to come. Hope looks down the road and knowing that I will be okay no matter what the outcome because of who God is. Now let me kind of give you an illustration of that. Back in the Old Testament in the, the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar was the king. He put up a, a giant gold statue and said, whoever does not bow down and worship me, I will cast into the fiery furnace. Three of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, failed to carry out the orders that Nebuchadnezzar had told them. They would not bow down to the golden statue. So Nebuchadnezzar heats up the fiery furnace and he tells them, I'm gonna throw you in here if you don't follow what I say. Daniel 3:16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego applied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and he will deliver us out of your hand O king now th those three men we're talking about faith right now we know God is here we're trusting in him right now but then verse 18 but even if he does not let it be known to you O king that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up even if it doesn't work out we are looking to the future. We know God is going to take care of us. That is hope. If we die, we die. Now, hope is not just that I hope this, I hope that. The reason for our hope is the object of our hope, the living God and his promises. Chuck Swindoll wrote this about hope. When you are discouraged, hope lifts you. <clears throat> when you are tempted to quit, hope keeps you going. When you fear the worst, hope reminds you that God is still in control. When you are forced to sit back and wait, hope gives you the patience to keep trusting. Hope is a long rope that we have between us and God's sovereignty and his power. Now there was a man who needed hope in the Bible big time. That was the Apostle Peter. The night before Jesus was crucified, Jesus had told Peter, listen, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, there's no way, Lord, that I'm going to do that. Of course, Peter did. And after he denied Jesus the third time, it says that he went out and wept 
bitterly. Peter was torn up about this. Then you add to the fact that later that day, Jesus Christ was put to death. Peter was a discouraged, hopeless man. A few days later, Resurrection Sunday, when the women came to the tomb and they found it empty, an angel said this to them, go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee, there you will see him just as he told you. Jesus made sure that Peter heard this word of hope from the ladies. And eventually, Jesus did appear to Peter. Now, John is often called the apostle of love. Paul is called the apostle of faith. But Peter is the apostle of hope. Peter writes his two epistles. The first one, the first Peter, it is an epistle of hope. He's writing to fellow believers who have been scattered about, who are going through difficult times, who are going through a fiery ordeal. This wasn't an empire-wide persecution, but it probably had more to do with social ostracism, police action, being ridiculed, maybe being beat up. So Peter is writing to brothers and sisters in Christ who are discouraged, who need hope. And so hope gives us an encouragement and enablement we need for daily living. So 1 Peter is going to give us a big dose of hope today. We're going to see three things. The first is this. We have a living hope. Second, we have an eternal hope. And third, we have a hope that we can share. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter. And we're going to begin in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And Peter says this, we have a living hope. He's speaking about your present life right now. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter begins by praising God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise him. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's using this to talk about their positions. The Father and the Son are totally equal, yet they have unique positions. So he's using this to differentiate between the first person and the second person of the Trinity. And he says that according to God's great mercy, now all of God's goodness towards us begins with his mercy. Mercy is the idea that God has pity on us. He has compassion on us. He knows that we're weak. He knows that we're frail. As the psalmist says, he knows that our frame is but dust. So he has mercy on us, and it says that this mercy is great. It's abundant. Peter writes, I mean, excuse me, Paul writes in Ephesians 4.2 that God is rich in mercy. He knows that we all need a big dose of mercy because we all tend to, to shrink back, to be afraid, to be scared. So he says, according to this great mercy, he's caused us to be born again. Now this word born again that Peter uses here is different from the word that Jesus uses in John chapter 3, but the meaning is the same. He causes us to be born from above. He gives us a second birth. He gives us new life in Christ. We're made a new creation. And this hope that he gives us is a living hope. It's a living hope because we have eternal life through a living Savior, Jesus Christ, who's alive right now. Jesus Christ is life itself. John 14, 6, For I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come through the Father but through me. How has he provided this living hope for us? As Peter says, it is through the resurrection Jesus secured a living hope for believers by conquering death. If he'd have stayed in the tomb, everybody does that. But Jesus came alive. He appeared for 40 days to many, many people, including at one point, 500 people gathered together. And 40 days after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven where he still is alive right now at the right hand of the Father. 
So God brought Jesus back from the greatest ordeal that any human has gone through. He had an incredible turmoil in the Garden of Gethsemane as he faced the prospect of becoming a sin offering for the world. He shrank back, but in the end he said, not my will, Lord, but yours. Jesus Christ went to the cross willingly and died to pay the penalty for sin. So if Jesus Christ went through all of this and he's alive right now, no matter what you're going through right now, he's right there with you. He knows what you're going through and he can bring you through whatever you're going through. So let me say this, we have a living hope. Your best life now is not a material hope. As we've seen through this virus, people lose their life, people lose their wealth. So your best life now is not your health and your wealth. Your best life now is spiritual and it cannot be taken away from you because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You have a living hope because Jesus Christ is alive right now and he's given you that hope. Second thing Peter tells us is that we have a eternal hope. Not only do we live right now with our hope, but we live our life right now with the end in mind where this hope is taking us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, he writes this. Therefore, <clears throat> prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The command is this. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fix your hope completely. That is the command Peter gives to us. Fix it completely. Fix it entirely. Fix your hope all the way to the end. And that hope is going to be through grace to be brought to you at his second coming. When Jesus comes back, the only way we will be able to stand for Jesus on that day is because of grace, because of unmerited favor, not that anything that anyone has done. Peter right here is focusing on the second coming, not on the celestial fireworks that will accompany Christ when he returns, but he's focusing on the amazing grace that brought you to the place that when Jesus returns, you will see him, you will be with him. It's because of the unmerited favor. Just like the, the hymn, Amazing Grace, uh, he begins, he says, grace taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve. In the last stanza, he says, even after 10,000 years, we'll still be praising him for what? For his grace, for his unmerited favor. The Christian life is about grace from the very beginning to the very end. It's about what Jesus has done on the cross, not what you do for him. And in this verse, Peter talks about fix your hope completely, and he tells us two modifying phrases. How do we do that? How do we fix our hope completely on the revelation of Christ? Here's the first thing he tells us. He says, prepare your mind for action. Now, back in Jesus' day, Peter's day, the men wore robes, long robes. So if you were fixing to move real fast to maybe run, what you would do, you'd pull your robe up, up to your waist, and you'd, with a sash, a belt, you would tie it around your waist so your legs would not be hampered, so you could move a whole lot quicker without tripping yourself. Today, we might say something like this rolling up your sleeves you know when somebody rolls up their sleeves it's like i'm ready to get to work i'm ready to do the hard things let me add it that is the picture right here and so metaphorically prepare your minds for actions roll up your sleeves pick up your robes do the work you need to do for god peter's saying this get rid of loose sloppy thinking be disciplined now in your thought life. So prepare your minds for actions. And second, 
keep sober in spirit. Keep sober. Be self-controlled. Be calm. Don't panic. Why? Because of God's grace in your life. That your Christian life began, began with it. It's part of your life right now. And it will end with it. Now, some of you right now are in a major battle with fear and anxiety over all that's going on in our world today. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, that we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. All of us are in this continual battle, this continual warfare within our minds, what we think. And that's why Paul will say later in Romans 12, 1, while we need... 12 uh, verse 1 and 2 why well, we need to be transformed in our thinking our minds need to be renewed so we're all in this battle over our thoughts and for some of you in particular right now your thoughts are running wild you're thinking the absolute worst you can't shut it down Paul tells us that you must begin to take that thought captive rein it in be sober in your thinking. Be controlled in your thinking. Let me give you an illustration. All of us, by nature, have a Mustang mind. Here's what I mean. A Mustang, a wild horse. A wild horse that doesn't want to be tame. A wild horse that surely doesn't want anybody to get up on its back. That's what we are, naturally. We have these Mustang minds. It's my mind. I can think what I want. Don't tell me what to think. Now, when we come to Jesus Christ, our minds begin to be changed, to begin to be renewed. And instead of a Mustang mind, which by nature is not self-controlled, our minds need to be changed to a war horse mind. A war horse. A war horse is a, a, a horse that an officer sits on. And the, the person on top of the war horse commands the horse which way to go. The war horse is under an authority of another. Now, as followers of Christ, our Mustang mind needs to be put away. We now become war horses. Jesus Christ is Lord over you. He now begins to direct your mind, to control your mind. I am called to follow as he leads. And we're called to transfer the authority of our life from me thinking loose thoughts, any thought I want. Now, we begin to bring them under control. We begin to give them over to Jesus Christ as the Lord of our life. So you have an eternal hope. You live with the end in mind. You will see Jesus again one day. It began with grace, it's gonna end with grace, and now you need grace right now to get through each day, day by day, and slowly begin to gird your mind for action. Roll up your sleeve, begin the hard work of coming under the authority and lordship of Jesus Christ. A third aspect that Peter shares with us about hope is this. We have a hope to share. You live your life right now. You live your life with the end in mind. But you live your life also with others in mind. It's not just about you. In 1 Peter chapter 3, the end of verse 14 and 15, Peter writes this. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Three things about this hope that we have to share, this hope that we live with others in mind. Here's the first thing. Don't panic, don't worry. Peter says, and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Peter there is quoting from Isaiah chapter 8. Basically, he's telling his, his writers that, excuse me, 
his audience that he's writing to, do not be shaken, do not be stirred up about the ordeal that's going on around you, the persecution around you. Do not let people knock you off of the hope of Jesus Christ. Don't let events make you forget who is over all. So don't panic, don't worry. Now he tells them a second thing to do. Acknowledge Christ as Lord over your life, verse 15, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Peter's telling them and us, Christ is not just to be one of many things in your life, but he becomes the center of your life. He's not just to be found on the periphery of your life, but he becomes the bullseye of your life. Sanctify means to set apart. It's an inner commitment. So when fear begins to grip you, you sanctify Christ. You pray. You go to him. You remind yourself of Jesus, who he is. He's Lord of the universe. And as Lord of the universe, he is with you right now. He knows your situation. He's over your situation. So don't panic, first. Second, sanctify Christ as Lord of your life. Make him number one. And third, he talks about be ready to share that hope. Two ways we do it. We do it with right words and a right attitude. Right words. Peter says this. We share this hope always being ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. If someone asks you today, how are you doing? Could you tell them? Could you say, I'm doing okay. It's a scary world, but I'm doing okay because Jesus is with me. Jesus is in my life right now. See, Peter knew about giving a defense. You go back and look to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, and Acts chapter 5. In each point, Peter was put to the test by the authorities. And each one, the power of the Holy Spirit, through that power, he was able to give a defense. He was able to speak out loud of who Jesus was. And we're called to be ready to do this. We're called to be prepared to do this. And that word defense is the word today where we get the word apologetics from. Defense means a verbal defense, a reason, statement, or argument. Now, we're not called to argue. I'll talk about that in a minute. But we are called to be prepared to talk about the hope that is within you. And what is that hope that is within us? Well, Paul writes in Colossians 1.27, Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now why is he our hope? And here's our message. Because of the gospel. Because of the good news. Gospel means good news. The good news that Christ came, died for sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And now whoever places their faith and trust in him can have eternal life. The gospel. The gospel begins with the fact that we're all sinners. We've all broken God's commandments. We've all gone our own way. And so God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and in doing so, paid the penalty for sin. And now whoever, whoever, rich, poor, American, Chinese, Whoever places their faith and trust in Christ can know forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Now, the gospel is the hope that's within us. But let's face it, we all get afraid at times of sharing that hope. And I think for two reasons, this is my opinion. The first one is that we don't feel that we know enough. 
Well, what if they ask me this question or that question? Well, you might not be able to answer it. But the hope that we have, the defense that we have, is not to answer every question. The hope that we have is that Jesus Christ died for my sins. He changed my life. And I often tell Christians they're afraid that they don't know enough. I, I tell them this. You probably know 10 times more than you think you do. The average person on the streets doesn't know. They have no idea. You know a whole lot more than you do. And our message is not to have the answer for every argument. Our message is very simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Acts chapter 16, as Paul tells the Philippian jailer. So one of our fears is we don't know enough. Our second fear, I think, is we don't want to be ashamed. Just like Peter's writing to those who are scattered about, who are going through a fiery ordeal, <clears throat> so too we, we're afraid if we mention the name of Jesus, we're going to be ridiculed, we're going to be scorned, and we might. But what we have is even greater. The benefits of the gospel to us and to others is far greater than the fear of being scorned. Paul wrote in Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for there's the power of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then the Greek. So those fears, you begin to pray about them. You give them over to the Lord. You ask for strength. You ask for grace to overcome those fears. Now, one more thing with the right words. You and I never save anyone. We just present the message. We are the instrument, the means God uses. Only the Holy Spirit can save anyone. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was given the growth. Same today. We're just seed scatterers. And you never know a heart that God has prepared will receive that seed of the gospel and re will respond to Jesus. Only the Holy Spirit saves someone, causes someone to be born again. And the means that he uses is the gospel through his people. Now let me ask you about your life. Think about it. <clears throat> My guess is you probably didn't hear the gospel for the first time and said, that's what I've been waiting for forever. Probably God used many different people in your life, and over time, the Holy Spirit began to soften your heart, and you were open to receive the gospel, the good news. Same thing right now. Someone loved you enough to tell you about Jesus. Now, we're called to love those around us enough with the right words to tell them about Jesus. Because in this time of crises, this time of panic, it also produces great opportunity. So we have the right words, but we also have the right attitude. He says, we, pro we share this gospel, defense of our faith, with gentleness and reverence. Gentleness means a mildness, a, a winsome and loving attitude, not arrogant, not overbearing, not know-it-all, and also with reverence, that is, a devotion to God and respect for your hearers. You too, think about this, were once blind. You too were once tone deaf. So don't be surprised if people you share with are the same way. The Spirit had to begin to work on your heart of stone. And so as you share the gospel, pray for those you share it with that the Spirit begins to soften their heart. His eyes see this. It's the idea of one beggar, that's who we are, telling another beggar where they can find food, where they can find water, where they can find life. We're never called to win an argument. We're just called to present the simple gospel of Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. It's never my clever words. It's always the power and the conviction of the Holy Spirit drawing. God just uses me with the right words, the right attitude. The gospel, let me just say one more thing. The gospel is offensive. It's a stumbling block. block. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 1, that the cross is a stumbling block. The cross was an instrument of extreme torture and death. 
Nobody would even thought about wearing a cross around their neck like we do now. That, that was offensive to everybody back then. So when we tell people about the cross, there's one way to be saved. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. You must turn from your sin and believe on him. That's offensive because it crushes our pride. It crushes all the things that we think we can do to save ourselves. So the gospel is offensive, but we, as followers of Christ, we're not called ever to be offensive. No matter how dark it seems, as born again believers, we have a hope, a confident expectation of the future based on God's character and God's promises found in his word. You have a living hope in your present life right now. You have an eternal hope. You live your life with the end in mind and you have a hope to share. You live your life with others in mind. I wanna close this with a benediction found in Romans chapter 15, 13. The apostle Paul writes this. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God's wonderful, wonderful people said, Amen.